What is up? Back again with the Two Tall Sports Podcast. Uh, my guest today is going to be Brandon Warren. He is a baseball writer covering the Minnesota Twins, and he has a website called Access Twins, and you can find it on Substack. Uh, he does a podcast called Postcast, Locked on Twins, where he, re he reacts uh, with a co-host to the Twins games. And uh, we have a nice conversation about Minnesota sports and what's it, it, what it's like to be a Minnesota sports fan. And it is not easy over the years, as many of you know, in all sports. So, but a fun conversation with him. He's a true Minnesota guy, born and raised there. So uh, this is a fun, fun conversation. However, I do have a bit of news that I want to share for my two cents today. Um, I don't want to say never, but for the moment or the time being, I am going to be taking a step back from the podcast. Uh, as hard as that is to say, uh, life, you know, is happening and career things are happening. Um, so far, not sports related, but after two years of podcasting almost every week and over a hundred different people and a hundred different episodes, uh, it's time for me to take the next step in my professional career. Uh, I can't say what it is yet. But uh, once I'm comfortable announcing, then I will. Uh, I'll probably save that for LinkedIn uh, if you're connected with me on there. Um, but yes, you know, I know it may come as a surprise to a, a lot of you. And, you, you know, we've gotten into a routine and it's amazing. And, it, and I've loved every episode and every, every response I've gotten and, and just all the things that have, you know, we've come a long way. So um, as sad as it is for me to take a step back, it doesn't mean I won't. And I may pop up and do an emergency episode every once in a while, depending on, you know, what's happening in sports, whether it's, you know, big trades or something big in sports. And I have an opinion on it, it may not be an interview. It may just be me. So uh, you might get an extended two cents of just me talking without an interview. Um, but it's just going to be too hard to keep this up, at least in the beginning when I start my new career. So um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. I know we just hit the 100 episode mark and it was like there's some momentum there and excitement, but sometimes, sometimes things do at least come to a halt or a pause. I don't want to say the end, but until I get my feet under me in my next career where I have time to come back to it and you know have time to reach out to get guests and write the scripts and you know, do all the preparation, do all the social media that I need to do to make it happen. You know, it's just, it's, it's kind of like a second job. So at this stage, I'm going to take a step back from podcasting. I can't say when I'm going to come back. And like I mentioned, I, I love doing this. I don't want to say never. And uh, who knows, I may find myself in sports somewhere, which would be awesome. Um, but for now, I'm going to take a step back. So bear with me. I've got lots of episodes. If you haven't heard the previous ones, please go ahead and, and check those out. That would be that would be awesome. Uh, I, I will leave the episodes up there. I'm not going to take anything down just because I'm taking a step back. Just wanted to let you know where I'm at in life uh, here. So if you do know me, you can reach out and, and see what's up. But I don't have anything right now concrete to deliver to you. But it, um, soon, I will be making a career move. So with that said, I want to thank everybody who's been here from the beginning, you know, everyone that's been a, a loyal listener, you tune in every week. I can't thank you enough. I really can't. Even if I don't even know you listening, I, I want to just say thank you. And I'm really proud of what we've built here and uh, all the guests that I've had on, everybody that's shared, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes an hour and a half with me if the conversation is going great. I want to just say thank you to every guest. I've had a lot of fun. I've had some big names on here. I've had some names that nobody knew about and turned out to be great episodes. It, it, it doesn't always need to be a big name, but for the big names that I've had, I've had some pretty big ones. So I want to thank every listener, every person that subscribed to the podcast, every YouTube watcher, everybody that's checked out my um, Instagram, and, you know, Two Tall Sports Podcast, all that stuff. Just everyone, even if you're a new listener, I got plenty of stuff to check back through. So uh, every episode, I feel like you can take something from and, and you can relate to it, at least in most cases, and it's something cool, a cool story about the minor leagues that maybe you didn't know about, you know, different companies, different people in the sports world that you just, who knows, you just never know. Um, but yes, this will be my last episode for at least a little while. I just want to put on pause. I know I keep repeating myself, but I just want to make sure everyone knows that I am very grateful and thankful that you've taken this ride for, with me for a little over two years now. So um, I don't want to say it's the end, but I, I, at some point I would hope to come back to it, but for now I'm going to take a step back. So uh, enough of me blabbing. I understand if anybody wants to reach out, hit me up at two tall sports podcast. Uh, if you know me, you know, send me a text or call 
uh, would love to catch up anyway. I don't get to see you guys enough. And, you know, all the people that listen that I don't even know about. So uh, send me a text, call, email me as uh, two, two tall sports podcast at gmail.com. If you feel comfortable doing that, if not, you know, I totally understand. I, I do apologize if you're, if I'm messing up your Thursday or weekend routine. And I, I love being a part of your lives, you know, in the podcast world and just give me, give me an hour of your time to uh, deliver some good content. So once again, I want to thank everybody for the incredible ride we've been on. I don't want to say never, but I am going to take a step back. So thank you very much. Love you all. And I hope to talk to all of you soon in some capacity so we can catch up and, uh, and see how everybody's doing. So it's all about connections in this world. So I want to thank everybody uh, for listening. And let me give you one last episode for the time being. We are pausing the pod for a little while, but let me give you one last episode with my guy, Brandon Warren. And, uh, I will hopefully see you sooner than later and have a great day. Let's get to the interview. Welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. My guest is going to be Brandon Warren. He is a Twins beat writer, as in Minnesota Twins. So we talk all about Minnesota sports today, a, a little bit on the T-Wolves and Vikings, uh, especially some of his uh, favorite and least favorite times as a fan. We get to that toward the end of the episode, but uh, a lot of fun. Uh, discussing the Minnesota Twins with him and kind of the direction of that franchise and some old school nostalgia. Uh, some of you might, may remember my episode with Denard Spann, former outfielder for the Minnesota Twins, and, and during that era of the Joe Maurer, Justin Morneau, Torrey Hunter, you know, those teams that were really good, Johan Santana. So we talk a little bit about uh, the nostalgic Twins from the last 15, 20 years. So get into that with Brandon Warren. And uh, he, you can find him at Brandon Warren on Twitter, I believe. And you can follow Access Twins. He does some post-game uh, stuff for them as well. So check him out there. As always, you can follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. Uh, check out the YouTube channel. If you're not there already, you can watch the interviews. I release them every Thursday morning, 4 a.m. Pacific time, Thursdays. Uh, just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. You can find the episodes there if you want to watch them. If you want to listen on the audio side, it's going to be Apple or Spotify. And it's just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. Find the episode that you would like to listen to. If you haven't done so already, please hit the five-star rating. That would be awesome. I have about 75 ratings on Apple. I'd like to get that up to 100 if we can. So if you're a new listener, please go ahead and hit those five stars. It takes you two seconds. The least you could do. That's all I'm asking. Free content. Give me a five-star. That would be awesome. You can also find it on Amazon Music, Apple, uh, I already said Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google Play, Pandora. You can find them there. I am on TikTok as well for you young people at Two Tall Sports Podcast. Wherever you can find your podcast, you can find me, Two Tall Sports Podcast. And with that, let's get to our interview with Brandon Warren. All right, welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a baseball writer covering the Minnesota Twins. He has a website called Access Twins on Substack. He is also a co-host of a Twins podcast, uh, Locked on Twins Postcast, where he breaks down uh, the post game with his, with his co-host as well. Uh, he's an avid Twitter user and, what, from what I can tell, a Diet Pepsi enthusiast. He is Brandon Warren. What's going on, Brandon? Uh, it's so exciting to be here. It's a beautiful <laughs> day where I'm at, and... Got to watch some baseball today, so it's a good day. Nice. That is a good day. Let's start, before we get to baseball, let's start with, with the Diet Pepsi obsession. A, a lot of people are very loyal to Diet Coke, so how, how would you describe Diet Pepsi as being better? It's a little crisper, I think, okay. but honestly, I'm not a person who, if you say Diet Pepsi and they say it's Coke, fine, I say it's fine. I'm not, I'm not going to throw a fuss. I'm not going to fight people in the restaurant over their allegiances. <laughs> I'll drink whatever there is, if it's Coke zero, Pepsi, whatever, I'm not too picky. I just, I don't like to get my calories from what I drink. So I'm, it's not good for you, but it's better than the full sugar in my estimation. I could I be wrong. No, I agree with that. that. That makes a lot of sense. Not picky. Yeah. That's good. Um, so I did see that you're a true Minnesota man from the state itself. Uh, what do you remember about growing up in sports there, especially in the twin cities, There's a lot of great players that came through there and any, all the sports, if you would like, but as far as being a sports fan and growing up in that area, um, how was it being a, a Minnesota sports fan? If it isn't obvious enough from my voice too, you can definitely tell where I'm from, which <laughs> is, it's a blessing and a curse. Sure. Cause it doesn't allow you to really trick people into thinking anything. And so I grew up Vikings, Timberwolves, twins, the mm -hmm. wild towards the end there. And I know that the, the kind of thing is that Minnesota sports are cursed or whatever, but sports are about losing in adversity and, every year 29 MLB teams lose if yes. you want to look at it that way so 
sports are about failure. And if you can't handle failure, you shouldn't be that wrapped up in them. So I enjoy the ride because the destination might suck is what I say. You know, if you can't enjoy the 2019 twins who win hundred plus games, set the record for home runs in a single season, but then get swept in the playoffs. If you didn't enjoy the ride, you had no point in even watching in October because the odds of winning the world series, it's, it's tough. You go in there against a bunch of really good teams. So right. I don't understand how people consume sports, but in Minnesota, I just enjoy the ride, baby. I think that's a very Minnesota way to look at things, right? Cause I know you guys Probably. haven't won a lot of championships, so I totally get that, but it's good. It, I, I like that. You got to enjoy the ride because it's mm-hmm. not just about the end result. It's about how you get there as well. So I, I totally can appreciate that. Um, and, and you did play some baseball yourself. I, I noticed you went to the, not, I had to make sure this wasn't the actual Northwestern. You went to university of Northwestern in St. Paul. Um, what was your experience there playing baseball and just going to school there, you know, staying close to home? Well, and I'm also repping my hometown Roseau for baseball. I was at a state championship game today before we recorded. So right. they, they lost seven zero. It broke down in the bottom of the sixth, but it was the number one team in the state. And so that's where I got my baseball education kind of underway was actually far North part of the state came down here, did some junior college type stuff, and then went to Northwestern and I played my first year there. And it basically came down to the fact that that first year I didn't play much because I was behind the all conference first baseman. And after that, it was, I couldn't afford to live work and still play. It wasn't about how much it cost to play. It was about how much rent cost outside of taking my time to play baseball instead of work. So sure. Put myself through school, made it kind of difficult, but I got to play a year, got to have a lot of fun experiences. I got some lifelong friends and, you know, I still break out the purple every now and then it was Northwestern college back in those days, but I have my purple Jersey still. And it, it's a lot of fun to go back and reminisce. My head coach is still there and they just had a really great season. They went to the, the, the division three world series down in Omaha, I think it was, or uh, nice. near, near Kansas city. And so it's fun to keep up with it. I miss it a lot. I even was thinking about that today. I miss playing competitively at that level, but I still get out and play softball a couple nights a week. And that's about all these aching joints can handle. So <laughs> I hear you, still man. making it happen in my thirties, but it's hanging by a, a thread here. Sure. And that's a very, uh, fairly small school, isn't it? Yeah. It's uh I think it was like 2,400 students when I was oh, there. Oh, okay. So Somebody, that's like a high school. Yeah, no, it was, it was like a high school down here. You know, okay. like I went to a pretty small high school relative to what we see in the Twin Cities here. I think the nearby school is six or 800 kids per class. So, okay. yeah, we were about 100 per class. We knew everybody, that sort of thing. So, no, very small college. Good chance if you had a friend who went there or had a friend that had a friend, you crossed paths at some point. Okay, nice. And I, I looked, at, looked at your college baseball bio. You were very forward thinking at that time about what yeah. you wanted. You were very, uh, you knew exactly what you wanted to do. It seemed like when the, the question was posed, what do you think you'll be doing in 10 years? You said, I'm going to be a sports writer. Yeah. Um, and you wanted to be, you know, GM of the twins. You knew at that age. So what was that like already in college, getting the wheels turning about being a sports writer? Well, the story about how I became a sports writer is actually really funny because I went to two years of school, took a year off to work, and then went back to school. And so I was a 22-year-old first, or a 21-year-old first-year student at Northwestern. And I had been working overnights, and I was kind of weighing my options as, oh, do I really want to go into journalism? And I had kind of made up my mind on kinesiology. I was going to be a personal trainer, something like that. And so I worked an overnight the night before orientation, and then I went in and they assigned me to the journalism group. And I was like, oh man, they, they didn't get that I wanted to do kinesiology. And so I thought, oh, well, let's just go with it. So uh-huh. I made like a $70,000 decision, sleep deprived, basically not wanting to rock the boat. Uh-huh. Now, um, double digit years later, <laughs> we'll just say that uh, 15 years later, we're, we're just uh, riding the wave right now, man. And it's, uh, it's been I shouldn't, I should say it's been 12 good years since I got out of college, but it's probably closer to about six or seven because it took a while to get into the industry, but I'm happy where I'm at and things have gone just terrific. That's awesome, man. I, and I did see you've worked for a, a number of different publications, uh, zone coverage, one of them sports radar. I think I saw the athletic yep. for a little while. So what's yep. it been like to bounce around? I'm sure you take something from every stop, but what's it been like to, to go through the journey of becoming to where you are now? It's tough when you're relying on other places. Like my big break 
technically speaking, was 1,500 ESPN here in the cities. And at the end of the year, their budget was all messed up. And so they let me go. And I spent kind of a year or two trying to find what was next. And it was kind of a fun lesson. In 2015, zone coverage snapped me up. And it was a guy who had been covering for like Yahoo Sports, who I kind of befriended. He'd hang around. And, you know, I um, I didn't really know him. I, was, I just treated him well because it was like, you know, you should respect people and be nice to people, even if they're not, you know, the Star Tribune, the Pioneer Press, MLB.com. Ends up that he and his dad start a company and they hire me for a, a nice little salary to cover the twins for about four years before COVID hit and, you know, everything kind of went to pot. So sure. I'm, I'm doing some light stuff with them right now on, on the side, but right now I'm working for myself and all that bouncing around made me think if someday I could figure out a way to do it myself, I'd want to, but there was good, valuable experience. Nobody let me go because I was a, you know, a difficult person to work with, at least not that I know of. Yeah. And so a lot of it was good for my structure, for, for honing and learning my voice. And when I write something, for the most part, you can probably tell I wrote it because there's lots of words, just like when I talk, lots of M dashes, lots of commas, lots of footnotes. But all that different experience in editing and writing and doing video and doing audio and radio and all that stuff, if you take something from all of it, eventually at the end of the day, the, the finished product you will have is hopefully as a polished communicator and storyteller. And that's what I hope to put out there, hope to create every time I make something, whether it's uh, whatever platform it's on. Yeah, that's great, man. I mean, you got, you have to, you know, take something from your experiences and now you're right. in a place where you're comfortable and, and you know, your voice, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, I did. Another part of your bio was that if uh, one of the questions was, I think you jokingly probably said, if you could be a superhero, you would pick Joe Maurer. Um, you know, he was a longtime homegrown twin, uh, yeah. eventually got the big money, which I know some twin, one of my best friends is a twins fan. So I hear all about this. Um, what are your thoughts overall on Joe Maurer's career and the money he got? And did, did he underachieve per se? Not for me, but I'm also a very like a first round pick even still doesn't have a guarantee of success in the big leagues. It's right. It's such a monumental accomplishment just to make it yes and first overall picks they get held to a standard the twins literally won zero playoff games that joe mauer played in so that's frustrating you know the the guy had you can make an argument anywhere from probably one to four or five best careers in twins history he stayed home when they signed him it was coming off an amazing season the concussion was out of his control right. and he hung on and was a very productive, if not amazing, big leaguer all the way till the end. Hats off to him. He, he's he's going to be a Hall of Famer. I'm not even going to – I don't debate that. He'll be a Hall of Famer based on his, his catching time alone. Sure. And when they signed him, he was coming off just an incredible season. So they really didn't have a choice. They were opening up a new ballpark that would have been burnt to the ground if Joe Maurer did not, did not stick there for the first eight years of the stadium. So – I, I really, or nine years in the stadium, I think his career was just fine. I just, again, it would have been nice to win a ring. It would have been nice to show more success in the playoffs, but he's just one guy and it's hard yeah. in baseball. It's hard in baseball, even as the catcher, you know, it's not like the quarterback in football, right. the point guard or the big man in basketball. It's, and a lot of fans too get that kind of viewpoint. You'll have a, a, a basketball fan that, you know, I don't know if LeBron's a good op observation but like a Steph Curry those guys can run the game and they right. can will teams to the championship or the cusp of the championship one player in baseball like Mike Trout can't really do that so for me Joe Maurer did absolutely fine with his career that's a great point too and yes basketball players you know is only five on five you can control on both ends you know baseball is a very it's an individual sport played on mm -hmm. a team you know it's very yeah. difficult to have one player. Mike Trout's a great example of that. But I want to go back just for nostalgia's sake. You know, some of the teams Maurer was on, they were special teams, man. You, I mean, just, I want to read out some names just for fun. Ron uh, Gardy was the, Garden Hire was managing. You yep. had Maurer, you had Morneau, you had Jason Kubel, Orlando Cabrera, uh, Denard Spann, who I've had on the podcast, Tori Hunter, the legend, Johan Santana, just to name a few. What, what brings it, what, what memories do you have of those guys and those teams? It was kind of a us versus the world mentality. They're playing in a stadium that nobody liked. 
It was yeah. a football stadium being used for baseball. Right. They, their budget reflected what they thought they could or couldn't do with the revenue or lack thereof. They had, a, I believe, a bad kind of contract where all the, the concession money went to the Vikings based on some licensing. So if you bought a hot dog at a Twins game, it wasn't going to the Twins. And <laughs> it, was, it was a frustrating period because you'd sense that the Twins were on the cusp of something and they couldn't go get that last piece. Now, they had a lot of very good pieces for a low market ball club. Yeah. But like one year, there was talk of going after like Alfonso Soriano and second base was a, was a wide open spot for them for a while. Third base was a wide open spot after Koski left. And so the frustration was, yeah, well, if you go get him, you're going to have to give up all those prospects who are your cheap big leaguers. You're not going to be able to pay him. So is it really worth it for three months of Soriano or is it really worth it for, you know, they wanted Francisco Liriano in the trade and we saw how good he was to start, but then he got hurt. So right. it was just, it was a very much a take what you can get small market us against the world mentality. And that just kind of shifted in the new park. Joe Maurer got hurt. Justin Morneau got hurt and they just were not built up there. They had so many first round misses after Maurer to the point where they kind of had to reboot the system and the soft reboot came when they drafted Buxton and and now 10 years later, he's finally getting his footing in the big leagues. Yeah, definitely. I'll get the Bucks in a little bit, but that's yeah. true because I played against the twins in the minors for a while, just their system. And mm -hmm. they really just, you're right. They didn't draft that well for a, a good amount of time. Yeah. They like span between from hour to span was a pretty, uh, pretty rough stretch. They had Matt Moses who didn't do anything and they had one year. Oh, four, they had like four first round picks. Glenn Perkins was pretty good at the end. Yeah. Trevor Plouffe was pretty solid, but yeah. they, they had a couple other picks that didn't do much because they had them from compensation rounds for back when free agents would sign as a type A or a B and, and all that. And that, yeah, they just, they missed on so many first rounders and it just caught up to them in the early aughts to the point where they were losing 90 games a year when I started covering them. Damn. Yeah. yeah. And the other yeah. problem was you ran into the Yankees too many times in the postseason. Yeah. The, the A's got them that one time in, I think it was 06, but then it was Yankees pretty much after that. I think yeah. the Yankees got them in 03 too. So mm -hmm. yeah, they haven't won a playoff game since I was a first year college student. I was actually saying this, uh, I tweeted it and I said it to a friend today. I said, the last time the twins won a playoff game, the Montreal Expos technically still <laughs> existed. So it's been a minute since they've done anything in the playoffs. It has, but maybe this team, as we transition to this year, you know, you mentioned Byron Buxton, the kid's an absolute beast and when healthy, yep. he seems like clearly one of the best players in the league. He's coming into his own. Now, how would you assess him so far? And maybe what, what he can be on this team? Well, he's run really hot and really cold and nowhere in between this season. He had a stretch where, he was opening up on everything inside 99 inside. He was putting it in the seats, upper tank. And then there's stretches where he swings at just, you know, sliders away, kind of that, that right on right slider that kind of separates the really toolsy guys from the polished guys. Mm -hmm. And he comes and goes with that. Tory Hunter never learned to lay it off. So you can have a career with that, but with Buxton, it's the, the physical tools are just off the charts compared to, really any other twins prospect I've ever seen. And I've been uh, watching the twins for about 30 years almost. So I think he's the most physically gifted twins player in franchise history. And I, yeah. I'll probably catch some guff for that, but some of the greats Rod crew didn't hit for much power. Killebrew struck out quite a bit, hit like 250. He has that gear that those guys did not have as a five tool player. He, he won't, when he's on full 100% Byron Buxton, he does not hurt you in any facet of the game. And he's actually like plus plus and pretty much all of them. So yeah, he's an MVP candidate. If he plays 130 games, anything less than that, it's like, ah, I wish he had more of him. Sure. Anything more than that. And it's like, you know, you're really playing with fire because he just hasn't played that many games before. So right. he's a very exciting player, but it's, it's not a crime to want to see more of him. I have to remind myself that when fans lamented, it. it's like, you know what? All they're saying is they want to see more Byron Buxton and fair point. Yes, definitely. And you have another kid that keeps getting hurt is that Royce Lewis guy. He's, yeah. he's he seems to be a, a good future for you guys, a future player as well. Well, he was really hitting well at AAA. And at that point, they had exhausted all their 40 man position players. So 
I don't know how soon they would have brought him up otherwise, but it was when Carlos Correa got hit on the finger. And so they bring up Lewis, throw him at short, hit him in the bottom of the order, and he, he responds phenomenally. So Correa comes back. They send Lewis out and say, hey, kid, go play left field, center field, third base. We'll move you around. We'll get you back to the big leagues. And they did that. Now, keep in mind, he hits the ground running at AAA. He hits the ground running in MLB. He had not played since the fall league in 2019, 2020, there's COVID. And then he tears his ACL at the end of 2020, misses all of 21. Right. Still, still. So this guy was uh, June 99 birthday. So he's 20. I think he just turned 23. So he's still a young kid, but he's going to have three missed seasons before the age of 25. He's an incredible personality and all that. And the other kicker of it too was, so he gets hurt in his first game back in the third inning playing center field the next day carlos correa goes down with covid lewis would have been at shortstop instead of center field filling in for him if it would have only been one more day oh. and it's just um and he was playing center bucks in center lewis getting hurt in center it feels like that area of the field is cursed at target field oh man and he used to be roamed by tory hunter so you've had some yeah. great play play there uh, you brought up Correa, which is where I was going to go next. You know, obviously, were you surprised? This was a huge free agent acquisition for the Twins. Uh, used to Obviously, uh, Correa used to be at the Astros. He doesn't re-sign there. He goes to the Twins on a short-term deal. What are your thoughts on what he's been so far for you guys? It was funny. The signing broke at, like, I don't know, it was midnight our time. And I'd fallen asleep. I've been falling asleep a little earlier because I got to work in the mornings. And so I wake up to this notification from the athletic and I blink and I blink and I blink and I rub my eyes and you know that stereotypical thing you see in the movies when people are trying to wake up yeah I was like that can't be real it's like 6 a.m I go back to bed and then um I just start kind of breaking down I'm like breaking down like the deal and the specifics I think what happened was it's hard to really get a feel for a city you want to spend eight or ten years in without a full off season of doing your research. Sure. They did not have that luxury with the lockout. So it came down to who's going to pay me the most over a short term, who's going to give me some protection in terms of years tacked on the back. You know, it's, it's a hundred million dollars. If he plays hundred, whatever million dollars, uh, 105, I think if he plays all three years and let's say if his left arm fell off tomorrow and he never plays again, he can opt back in not a bad chunk of change. It's, it's going to undercut what he might've made otherwise, but he's still taken care of. But I think if, if you find that he has taken to your city, you probably have to look into like an eight year deal with him, 280 million, somewhere in that 30, 32 million range. And I think the twins should be willing to do that. They got a deal with Buxton. They're only going to have to pay Buxton a ton of money. If he wins the MVP or finishes in the top 10, which you hope for, but to have those two guys up the middle where you have to be strong to be a good team in this league right now, why not? Yeah. Lewis is, Lewis is not going to be back for another year, and he was already kind of questionable to stick it short long term. Have him be your future third baseman, second baseman, utility man like Ben Zobrist, and get your franchise cornerstones at short and center. I think that's perfection. Yes, I would agree with that. And just on a side, for you, were you um, anti Correa just coming from the Astros scandal? How did you view him once he got to the Twins? Never really thought about it as even a possibility, if I'm being honest, just yeah. because the Donaldson signing was such a big deal. And that was similar money as far as total. I think it was like 100 with options and stuff, but it was four years instead of three. Right. And the Twins have never paid this kind of money to any player. So, I actually had in my mind that they'd probably try to sign Trevor story, which yeah, I think would have been just fine too. That was kind of the drum I was banging all off season. And I did not see him going somewhere to play second base. Now I know he's got some throwing issues. I know Xander right. Bogarts might have one foot out the door. Still. I thought the twins had a chance to land story. I also thought the Astros did because he's from Texas. Okay. And so I, I really had my heart set on story. And when they signed Correa, who I want to say signed just shortly before, story did Korea before story um it really surprised me but I 
I didn't bring into it any baggage. And if it was good enough for Byron Bucks, then it's good enough for me. Yeah. And you know what? It's nice when you get a team that goes for it, right? Kind of like the Timberwolves. It feels like Minnesota sports, they're starting to like go for it. You know, they're yeah. not just going to be a small market team, a doormat like some of these other places. I, it's, gr- it's probably great for you to see that. Well, I think that the Wolves are going to take an identity, uh, their identity from A Rod and Mark yes. Laurie, the, the co owners. I mean, A Rod's the, the front, you know, the, the, the face figure of the, head. Yeah. Yeah. And Lori's the money. So that there was just a whole different vibe. I went to when they beat the Clippers in the play-in game. Oh, nice. Pat, Patrick Beverly jumping on the scores table. Oh and all yeah. That. And it was electric. <laughs> I have never felt the vibe like that at target center. And I've, I, I didn't go to any of the 2004 games. I wasn't quite down here yet when they were in the playoffs against the Kings and the Lakers and all that. But it was an incredible, incredible vibe. And I think they're going places with Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns. I, and, I totally agree with you. Yeah. We'll see what they do with D'Angelo Russell. But yeah, uh, right, right. But I, I, li- I, I do like where that organization is going. Um, back to the Twins. We got to talk about Luis Arise, which, you know, hitting over 350 as far as I saw up to this point this year. Yep. And I saw someone write, it's the ABC top three of the lineup, Arise, Buxton, Correa. You know, that's a hell of a first three of a lineup. And then I even saw an article that said Ichiro said Luis Arise is like his favorite hitter right now, something like yep. that. But what are your thoughts on him? And just now that lineup is really starting to take shape. Yeah, he actually met Ichiro in Seattle over the last week here. We were in Seattle, and so he got to meet him. Yeah. The so I actually did the research for the twin series against the Rays for Bally. And I found that hitters one, two, three in the twins lineup had the highest OPS in all of baseball. So even with Buxton missing some time, Korea missing some time, arise at times has hit lower in the order against lefties, or, you know, maybe has come in later when a righty comes in, they do a lot of mixing and matching, but it's, it's very clear. It's the top third. And then the rest of the team, the, the nice thing is the rest of the team is six, batting order spots but it's about 10 or 11 guys who can all play on a given night they have gary sanchez who's looked at times pretty good you know the total package not a lot of on base percentage not a lot of contact but he's done a pretty decent job behind the plate they're they're shuttling guys in and out trevor larnick alex kirilov kirilov's back up with the team for the arizona series now because polanco's going on the il and so they have depth but you set the tone with the first three and then there's always a new kind of hero every night, assuming it isn't one of the big guys, Gary Sanchez might hit a clutch double Gio Urshela has been their it guy. I say that on every platform I visit it's he's their, their glue guy. It's defense. It's a big hit. You got a guy hitting 260, and you just, you look at him you're like, how is he a, how is he anything for a big league team? That's in first place but he makes big plays at third base. He's been incredible chasing foul balls and all that small stuff that third basemen and infielders can do that kind of alter the course of a game. And, you know, replacing Josh Donaldson was not going to be an easy task, but I don't think the twins regret that trade for a second. The offense has been at times inconsistent, but in general, very good. I was going to say, I was looking at the just team stats around the league and the twins are top 10 in most every category. Like you guys yeah. are very consistent. And speaking of those, you got, you brought those ex Yankees in that they kind of gave up on. I know Gary Sanchez behind the plate, yeah. not the best, but it's kind of cool to see like offensively at least and on the pitching side too, but offensively you guys are in the top 10 for most categories. Yeah. They're, and they're doing it with depth. They're mixing yeah. and matching They're Chris Archer, four innings and go to your bullpen. He's, Rocco Baldelli's not pushing guys to do things they're not capable of in the moment. And it gets a lot of people upset because you want to see guys pushed, but then fans who want to see guys push don't want to see guys who are pushed fail. And again, baseball is a game of, a, of failure. So you mitigate that in every way, shape and form you can. But the problem is you have to see failure coming before it happens. Otherwise sure. there was no point. And so, right. you know, getting a guy out after four, tough innings maybe holds him to one or two runs why didn't he go back out for the fifth you were up four two well if he goes out and gets bombed in the fifth and all of a sudden you're down six four and end up losing the game you you tried to get too much out of that guy so right. i think they have a good feel for what guys are capable of they put them in positions to succeed and it allows your sum at times to be bigger than your parts because you're you're mixing and matching you've got guys who hit lefties guys who hit righties guys who can play short guys who can play all over the place. And right now it's a team that I think is surprising a lot of people based on all these factors. 
Yeah, and just on the pitching side, it's kind of funny. You got these these veterans that are like Archer. You mentioned Sonny Gray uh, is really mm-hmm. good this year. Joel Ryan's a young kid that that's been up, and so I, I've seen at least pitching wise. It seems like, and you got the bullpen. You got one. What's the dude, Duran or Duran that throws a like yep. hundred? Oh my yep. god! Yep. Yeah. They have they they have the haves and the have nots. Right. So Sonny Gray and and um, Joe Ryan were out for quite a while. Gray has been dealing with a pec thing, and he had a hamstring. And Gray had, or sorry, um, Ryan had COVID, so he missed Toronto. Would have missed Toronto anyway, and then missed some games after that. And they just kind of stemmed the tide. They were mixing and matching with Devin Smeltzer, a lefty who throws like 88. And um, Dylan Bundy, like whatever's left yeah. of Dylan Bundy, which is, is not much at this yeah. point. You know, they're, they're really trying to push a bunch of different buttons and they've stemmed that tide. And now Gray and, and Ryan came back and, and looked pretty solid for the most part in Seattle. Sure. They're getting closer to 100%. Again, it stinks that Paddock's out for the year. It stinks that Maeda is still working his way back, yeah. but having those two guys back and pushing some of the other guys further down makes the rotation look that much better. And, you know, they, they dealt okay with the Yankees Rays run there with Toronto. They were five and four, which is honestly all you can ask against teams that good. So it's, yeah. it's interesting dynamic. And let's talk about the division for a second. The AL Central is very winnable for you guys. The White Sox yep. kind of took a step back this year. You know, Cleveland's kind of in the mix, but it looks like it's – do you believe it's the Twins division to lose? Well, I don't want to go out on a limb quite like that, yeah. but I think they're better than the Guardians, and I think the White Sox might be having what happened to the Twins last year happen to them this year was just dogged by all these different small things. There's big things, too. Certainly Tony La Russa doing things that the fans don't care for and players. You are mean like, like uh, intentionally walking a guy with two strikes, one and two or something like that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's uh that's one of them. That was, <laughs> that was certainly curious. I, I bet you've never done that before. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think the white Sox are having that, that stretch and they're getting some guys back. Lance Lynn is back. I know I think it was Kopech through a bullpen recently and he's ra- wrapped up and ready to go. But they've just been so inconsistent offensively. Yeah. Grandal's having a bad season. Mancada's been a disaster. Robert hasn't stayed healthy. Jimenez hasn't been right where they need him to be. Outside of Jose Abreu, who's basically ageless. Yeah. And then Jake Berger, who's having a really, really interesting season playing third base for them. It's been a mess. In some respects, though, you look at that and say, they're going to play a ton of games against the Royals and Tigers the rest of the way. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not counting them out. But it certainly does feel like in, in some ways they are getting in their own way. They are the ones who are causing themselves to be under 500 at this point. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I want to talk about your podcast real quick. So I know you obviously you've been on the writing side for a long time, but you started doing the postcast after Twins games. What's it been like for you to not only write about the Twins, but also create content on the podcast side and speak about it on camera and, and, and on the mic as well? Well, and I also have a 1990s baseball podcast too that's on oh, cool. hiatus right now. So, oh, okay. I host that with Greg Olson, who pitched for the Orioles and then a bunch of other teams in the late 80s and early 90s, actually into the 2000s. Because, you know, relievers, if you can get people out, they'll keep you forever. Yeah. As far as twin stuff, it's just kind of old hat to me, kind of second nature. I just talk to people on the camera like I'm talking to you or on the podcast like I'm talking to you, just like they're here, just like I would write. And basically, I just kind of, taught myself to hopefully mitigate the ums and the ahs and all that and just take your time try to be polished and just be you because being you is what got you here it's kind of like what they say as guys move up the rungs in the minor leagues right they may want to change something about your wind up or your arm motion your arm slot but being you is what got you to where you are and you should never lose sight of that and so for me doing videos and stuff. It's like, well, if I can do writing and I feel comfortable on camera or on an audio platform, just go into it and have some fun. But I got my feet wet doing high school football games. So those may have been a little bit bumpier about 10 or 12 years ago than things go right now. Okay. So you're, are you into wanting to do play by play? Are you totally done with that? I I liked it. I don't know if I would do it would I do it as a job? If it, I mean, if it came together for me, I, I probably would. I actually did a play-by-play run for Team USA's U18 team back in 2009. They came to Minnesota on a barnstorming tour 
And so Francisco Lindor was on that team, Lance McCullers, Albert Almora Jr., Matt Barnes, Bubba Starling, a few other guys who have, uh, Nicky Delmonico, Blake Swihart, guys who have had a lot of different levels of success in the big leagues, but they're the best players in high school at that time. So okay. I had fun broadcasting that and I feel like I could do it again and I would enjoy it, but I just don't have it as a front burner issue in any sure. way, shape or form. Right. Uh, I would do want to talk about how you're very active on Twitter. And so I was curious, how, how do you handle, you know, the, the, the haters that come up or you just like the way, you know, your messaging comes across, what's it like to be, you know, uh, you're being that active on Twitter. You have to be careful. It's yeah. because things will be taken in a way you don't intend them. I don't say it's the wrong way because you can only control what you create. And then the reaction is the reaction. Sure. You just have to take ownership of what you say and be careful the biggest thing I learned is if you say something, you better mean it. And that's in writing too. If you say something, if you have to say a hard truth about someone and you believe it, you can look them in the face. And, and that's, that's what it's all about, being accountable, having accountability, having integrity. Sure. And I, I learned a lesson, or I wouldn't say a lesson, but it was definitely a, the aha moment. I, 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 my first year covering the Twins was 2013. And I wrote, I think in probably June, don't be surprised if the twins trade Justin Morneau. He's coming to the end of a contract, having a tough year. Twins having a tough year. It would have just made sense for him to go to a team independent race. He goes to Pittsburgh, does his thing, and, and that's that. So I write that in June. He gets traded later on, I think probably like six weeks later. But I get into the clubhouse, and I'm, a, I'm the guy who's got to be there first. I got to see the lineup card. I got to type up the lineup and tweet it. But I just want to be there first because I don't want to be late. It's the only thing in life that I'm on time for get in the clubhouse. A lot of times it's just me and some pitchers in for treatment or whatever. There are two people in the clubhouse when I get in there and it's me on one end and Justin Morneau on the other. Now I have no idea if he reads the press pack that comes out every day. He might, he might not. My stuff was in there, but that was like, you know, if he walks past me to go out to early hitting and he looks me in the eye, am I going to feel like I said something I shouldn't have said? And I didn't, I wrote it as though, it made sense. Pending free agent, twins need a fresh start. He deserves to go play for a good team. And it ended up happening. But that was my aha moment where it was like, boy, I'm glad I didn't say anything I didn't mean or I didn't go inflammatory, which a lot of people do. Um, just got to be your true self, be accountable, but don't apologize for being yourself. And I, it took me a long time to learn that. I think that's great. I think that's a great lesson and it's good and good for you. It's, it's not a fake, you're not coming off as fake or just trying to drum up stories. You actually felt that and you actually had his best inter interest at heart. It sounded Well, like. and yeah. I think I did yeah. have a lot of stretches where I struggled with my identity as far as being a serious reporter, a person who has fun and kind of a mix of the two. Sure. So I, I still deal with that on a daily basis, but at the end of the day, if I'm having fun and I'm not hurting anybody, you know, I'm blocked by Nick Gordon on Twitter. I never said anything mean to him. I really sure. didn't say anything mean about him. I just said I didn't think he was very good. And apparently he got wind of it and blocked me. Gotcha. It okay. is what it is. You know, I, I not everybody's going to like you. No, and that's fine. I, it took yeah. me a long time to realize that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, last couple questions. Um, one of my favorite baseball movies is Little Big League. Uh, it's probably, you know, one of, it's just one of the more, more well-done baseball movies. Any, uh, any thoughts about that movie as far as the, the city and the, the Minnesota Twins? Yeah, so I actually, I, I helped co-host a radio show on Sunday mornings on the station that the Twins were broadcast for a few years. And I missed one weekend. It was either my, it might've been my 10-year high school reunion or it might have been just a baseball reunion but that weekend they had in studio the kid who played billy haywood his name is luke i can't no remember way name. billy haywood yeah so i missed him the year before i was there when sandlot came through okay so so ham and squints were there nice so i had to meet those guys i have a picture with the, the guy who played ham um and that's kind of cool but yeah. i missed out on billy haywood so Damn. Uh, Luke, I think it's Luke Edwards, but I'm not sure about that. Okay. So I had to, I got to talk to, I did my hit radio hit over the phone. So I missed out on seeing him. And at that time though, when that came out, I was a eight year old boy head over heels for baseball. And like, what would have been cooler than managing the twins as a kid? So <laughs> that one and angels in the outfield were just oh. on a loop at my house. And um, I, I still watch those and yeah. you know, maybe they don't hold up and maybe they don't really 
grasp the, you know, I think I, I do believe the, in the romanticism of baseball, like they say in Moneyball, but you can have some fun with it too. I mean, air bud doesn't make basketball look bad no. or football, the golden, <laughs> the golden receiver retriever, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can have fun with it, if it's a Disney movie or whatever, sure. It doesn't have to be nuts and bolts inside the uh, white lines. You can have some fun with it. And those two movies were my vices that as a eight-year-old kid i agree with that and the fact that like randy johnson and griffey were in those movies too lou Pinella's was in it there were a few others too because yeah. uh kevin elster played on the twins on he was uh elster had that pop-up season in the 90s where he hit like 20 some 20 some home runs in like 96 and lenny webster who was a twins catcher there were a few guys who did cameos that i don't think we even knew at the time who they were and it was a different time you know the internet and social sure. media so we didn't know every team's backup catcher or all that but yeah there are a few easter eggs as far as other baseball guys in there so it's uh it's a good movie i think mickey chettleton was in there too which is he might have been yeah i think he winks at him and says uh flips the ball to him after catching the last out of a game if oh, i'm not okay. mistaken yeah, yeah yeah that sounds right yeah um okay last question as far as uh, best moment in Minnesota sports history in your lifetime, and what do you think the worst moment in Minnesota sports history? Any sport. Well, the Twins won the World Series when I was five, but I wasn't, you know, I was not. Maybe in, the last 20 years. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. in tune with that. So the last 20 years, man. See, the problem with the Twins is, is that – they haven't won a playoff game in almost that long. Right. So, I was thinking uh, the, the Minnesota miracle a few years ago with Stefan Diggs. I broke my couch uh, <laughs> in that moment. That, that, or the twins winning game 163 over Detroit, which yes. I had to tell my girlfriend at the time I couldn't be talked to because I was like this. She is now my wife. She is now pregnant with our second child, which is very exciting. Congratulations on yes, that. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, Minnesota miracle for sure. And then after that, it's probably the, I think it was Alexi Casilla singling home, Carlos Gomez with yes. Fernando Rodney on the mound, if I'm not mistaken, future twin at the time. Uh huh. Uh, and again, both of those led to letdown in true Minnesota fashion. The next week, yeah. the Vikings don't show up and uh, get smoked by the Eagles. The next series, the twins don't show up and same as it ever was against the Yankees. But like I said, enjoy the path, enjoy the trip because the destination will probably suck. <laughs> i you know what I, I appreciate that that's totally yes. that's totally great okay you've yeah. been great I, yeah go ahead no 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 i oh. i have nothing to add i think i've yeah. pretty much emptied out the old uh notebook here no that's awesome i, I really appreciate that where can everybody uh, everyone find access twins follow you on twitter all that stuff so at brandon underscore w-a-r-n-e on twitter otherwise access twins.substack.com just your email gets you a free subscription so you get a notification every time i post something new Every now and then I'll post something with a paywall that's five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year, or $1 if you want a PDF of an individual article. Paywall comes down after 48 hours. So it's a soft paywall just to say, hey, if you pay, you get something a little earlier, a little incentive so I can make some money. But yeah. for the most part, it's a, it's a lot of statistical stuff and then postcasts, and it's a lot of fun. Awesome, man. Well, thank you very much. It was great to have you. And I hope this is the Twins year. At, at some point, they got a breakthrough. So hopefully it is. Knocking on wood. I don't know if you can hear it, but I am. <laughs> thanks, man. I appreciate it. You got it. My thanks to Brandon Warren. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode, and especially the, uh, the mindset of a Minnesota sports fan. It's definitely been tough over the years. They don't win that often. So, uh, But it seems like things in that area are looking up. So Hopefully he and his twins can have a, a, a happy end of the year this year uh, in Minnesota. As always, you can follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. Check out the YouTube channel. As you know, Two Tall Sports Podcast. Subscribe, like, share, all that stuff. On the audio side, it's Apple or Spotify, Google Play, Pandora, Amazon Music. Wherever you get your podcast, just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. And where you're able, please hit the five-star rating, leave a comment you know, a like, a share, anything, uh, send it to a friend. If you like the episode or any of my episodes, I got over a hundred of them. I'm sure you like one of them. So, uh, please do so and, uh, help us grow the show. That'd be a lot of, uh, uh, much appreciated. So anyway, with that, thank you for listening as always. And I'll see you soon for another great episode. See ya.